and you're going through all the fear and like, God, why is this happening? But also like, man, what are we going to do? And I just felt this, like, I felt like I had an opportunity to really to either get bitter or to get better. Mm -hmm. And I really felt God like saying like, you got to man up. Like you, you like, how are you going to provide for your family? How are you good? Cause I'm like, how are we going to do medical bills? Mm -hmm. How are we going to, you know, take care of this? We're dual income now. And I kind of been leaning on my wife, which I think is cool. It's a good cool synergy, but I'm like, dude, like this, I don't know what the future, how are we going to raise a family? How are we going to pay the bills? Plus we're losing our homes because of the big short. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Darren Woodson Show. Today's guest is Sean Cannell. Sean is a YouTuber, international speaker, and coach that helps entrepreneurs build their influence and income with online video. Sean, man, glad to have you here today. Ben, Darren, fired up to be with you and your community and uh, excited to talk about life and YouTube. Yeah, 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 yeah that's going to be a lot of good talk. Yeah. Look, man, we've been biting at the bit to get to you. Uh, I know Ben has because we're young YouTubers. <laughs> and we, we, well, we're old, we're but, old, but well, I'm the oldest, but, but we are just so, you know, thrilled to have you on, man, because we're, we want to digest what you're throwing out today, man, because we, we want to continue to grow. We're excited. And before this show, you, you could probably hear the excitement in my voice and, and what I see for, for our podcast and those that are listening to the show today that are young YouTubers. I have a 20 year old sitting here right now. Who's working our switcher that, uh, my 20 year old son who. He's around a lot of t a ton of YouTube YouTubers, and and that's what he's on all the time. It's like it's crazy how things have wor worked nowadays. Mm -hmm. It used to be CBS, ABC, ESPN. You're getting all the information from YouTube now. I mean, you're getting the show. You're just watching you know content con consistently through YouTube. So we want to go back, and I want to I want you to tell your story, Sean, of you know where you grew up. What was the family lifestyle like when as a child? And then how, and then progress it all the way to to, to where you are currently. So, uh, give us a little background, a little color of you know where you grew up and what was the what, what was your childhood like? Yeah, yeah. So for me, um, you know, it's crazy because today I think it's over two million subscribers and wrote a book. It's like the number one best selling YouTube strategy book in the world and have all these different opportunities. But it seems insane because I'm a small town kid no connections. You said it. YouTube's like the new CBS, NBC, but no connections in Hollywood. You know, the gatekeepers are gone. No, no one to put me on or whatever. I'm just a small town kid that started shooting videos in my bedroom. And in fact, um, I grew up in Arlington, Washington. Mm. You know, I played football. I was terrible. I, I was on <laughs> JV. One time we were so far ahead in a game that of course they let the JV go out and play and it didn't matter, <laughs> but I was wide open for this pass and I was in the end zone and the quarterback just shot that pass. And, and sure enough, just slip right through my fingers. Like oh, I had butter on my hands, man. Man. No stakes, nothing on it. And I'm just like, man. So I learned that my, my spirit was crushed for football <laughs> and it's, it led me down the path of trying to figure out video. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, grew up in a small town and for me, I got started, um, in 2003, I started to intern at a church. Mm. And so Arlington, Washington, an hour North of Seattle, um, I just, uh, I actually got into a lot. I got expelled from Christian public, uh, from Christian private school. You're a thug. And, I didn't know yeah. you were a thug, man. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother story, but like I got, ex I got expelled from Christian school cause of like stuff with ladies and like broke into the school to throw a party and my man. hugs and like, you know, I, I mean, come on when you're raised by Wu-Tang and Eminem, like, I don't know. I was, there we go. I was, uh, <laughs> So I even had, I had my head shaved with the bleach. I mean, this was no. like the real slim shady. Oh, right. Like, I love it. This is that exact moment. So anyways, I, I eventually uh, wanted to intern just to stay out of trouble. Like there were some friends who were kind of a bad influence, but I love my friends. And I just wanted to be like, listen, I'm working and I'm interning at this church and I'm doing some courses online. And so I volunteered at this church, kind of sight unseen. I didn't really have a vision for why I want to do that other than just to like stay busy and, you know, be in the house of the Lord kind of a thing. And my youth pastor said, hey, start making videos for the youth ministry. This is 2003. And we had 16 kids in the youth ministry. We were shooting on a 
HV30 yeah. camera that had mini DV tapes in it. So I would shoot an hour of footage, have to plug in a firewire cable, capture minute for minute for an hour to the computer, edit in Adobe Premiere. Didn't even know what I was doing. <laughs> You're supposed to select when you open up the video editing software, NTSC, which just means kind of like America right. or, or PAL, which is the European format. I picked PAL because it <laughs> sounded more friendly. I was like... <laughs> Because it says pal. Like, I was like, yeah. Like, yeah, that's good. Uh, I like pal. pal. I don't know what these terms mean, <laughs> like pal. So the footage was all jittery because it was like the wrong frame rates because I literally just jumped in and started uh. creating videos. And I would capture this footage minute for minute, edit it down from like an hour to 10. I would have to capture it back onto the mini DV t- uh, tape. I'd take that, put it in a VHS oh, converter. Wow. Yep. And put it into a VCR, which played on the projector Wednesday night at youth groups. Now, churches don't have a lot of money if you're in a small town. Right. Because even in 2003, I'm not sure why we had technology from 1982. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's kind of when I started. And the huge lesson was I was doing it every week. I'm a volunteer. Mm. I'm waiting tables at Red Robin. Got married a few years uh Uh, Later, I've been married for 15 years, just had a kid and, but I was doing videos every week and YouTube hadn't even started yet, but I was learning the discipline of consistency because every week we were going to play these video announcements and our youth ministry. In fact, eventually the senior pastor was like, why don't you make these videos on the weekends? Mm. So now I'm making 104 videos a year as a volunteer. This is 2004. And YouTube hadn't started yet, but I'm getting like my content creation muscles built up. Right. So the first YouTube channel I started was 2007 for my church. So it was a blessing to be so early in the game. Today, I'm helping people find cameras and do video. I went through that whole early stage of kind of scratching my own itch of not selecting the wrong frame rate PAL versus <laughs> NTSC because I know people needed guidance with the same thing I had gone through. So did you have any dream to be in front of the camera or did you always want to be on the backside uh, and, and, and you know frame up everything and, and be on, a, on the production side of things? That's a great question because, you know, I think I had the dream to do it, but I even think about in business and when you think about being a number one or a number two, I guess in in athletics as well, you think about there's the lead role and the support role. And I really, I really liked that support role for a couple of reasons. I think it was safer. I was, there's something about being that front guy that takes the full hit, right? Or (laughs) something about being the CEO that has the whole books. Everyone else is getting a paycheck. He had to like put all the money up front to like, you know, bootstrap the thing. So I kind of liked the second person role, but the other reason I liked it was because of learning. Mm. Like I just, there's so much opportunity for observation, for learning, for absorbing wisdom. And so whether when I was in the youth ministry and at church, I was, editing videos of the pastor. I was, uh, you know, chopping up the sermons on the weekends, you know, fun fact about Joel Osteen, one of the most influential communicators now who's viewed like by millions of people in uh, over a hundred countries of court Lakewood as thousands of people. He was his dad's video editor for, I believe over a decade. Mm. And one of the things he learned by being that support role was his dad, like all preachers do, they say landing the plane. You just know that the plane's going to be circling. They're like, listen, (laughs) 55 minutes into the sermon, I'm landing the plane. No, you aren't. (laughs) No, you are not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He had to chop the sermons down for TV 27 minutes. Well, his dad would always preach 45. So he was sharpening himself as a communicator like, man, what can Mm. we cut away? How can we make this, like Jizza from the Wu-Tang says, (laughs) half short and twice strong? (laughs) How can we actually be more concise and more clear as a communicator? So I loved the support role because for years, whether it was at that church, then in 2010, I started a business where I started to do YouTube video production and YouTube content for authors and speakers and a lot of other pastors and then even some YouTubers and some other influencers. So I just always wanted to learn as much as I could. And it was kind of a tension between probably the fear of stepping out Mm -hmm. and actually being like putting yourself out there on the internet. That's scary, but also patience wanting to use that whole season as preparation for eventually one day, maybe being out there on a platform of my own. You know, it sounds your story sounds familiar to a lot, Ben. And we and as we do interviews, you always. It sounds like those that that become success successful at some point, they always go back to at some point they served mm-hmm. without getting paid, without having uh, you know someone patting them on the back. They just served, 
and you you served the church. You did. There were no paycheck. You're right, working at, at the little restaurant, uh, getting a paycheck. But at, on weekends, that's what you were doing, and you cut your teeth that way, man. And and you're, that was a learning process. And like you said, it was a season, and, and and you continued to grow and grow through that. So when did you start to? think that you wanted to branch out and I know I'm moving too fast here, but oh, when do you yeah. think you wanted to start branching out on your own and start making this an actual business? Well, I caught a vision for that. I mean, the real major kind of Genesis of what I'm doing today was 2009. And after I'd been doing video and young couple been married to my wife a couple of years and we were dual income, she was waiting tables also and working at Starbucks. And now I'm at the church, also waiting tables. And I started my business called Clear Vision Media, doing video production for others. Just kind of like young hustlers trying to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And we had bought a couple houses because, uh, you know, around 2006, (laughs) there was the rise of everything. And we're like, oh, what? We could buy a house today and maybe just eat top ramen. And if we could float this payment on the 80, 20 arm, which was our first loan, um, you know, then we'll just flip this thing. And then sure enough, the big short happened and, and, and no joke. We literally lived in this house in Marysville, Washington that had baseboard heaters and a wood stove. And we had two roommates as a newly married couple. That was a bad idea. Pa- mm, paper yeah, thin walls. Uh, I mean, no, come on. Yeah. 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 You know, because we were like, hey, if we can just hang on to this thing, it's going to appreciate in value so fast because there's a frenzy in the market. Depends on who you're listening to. And I don't know if any nobody really saw it coming or whatever. But we the rule of the house was you can only turn the baseboard heater on in your bedroom, not on the whole house because it's too expensive. If you want the house warm, you better split some firewood and make a fire. <laughs> and so I would go out in the morning with a snowboard jacket on. The butter would literally, because Washington's cold oh, in the winter, yeah, yeah. it'd be like frozen, like just trying to, uh, it, it was a horrible idea. And then sure enough, big short happens. Well, 2009, my wife almost dies. Mm, wow. Uh, yeah. And what happened was um, a couple years earlier, she went on a trip to the Philippines and she got like maybe food poisoning. A bunch of people did, but it triggered an idiopathic. We found this out later, an idiopathic chronic illness called gastroparesis. But for years, doctors didn't know what she, what was happening. Mm. She's throwing up five, 10, 15 times a day. Wow. We're going to specialist after specialist. And some of them are even saying, why don't you just eat a burger? Why don't you stop being bulimic or anorexic? Why don't you just... And she's like, no, something's very wrong. And she eventually drops to 82 pounds and she has to get a feeding tube. First it goes in her nose, then it goes Jay Junum in her side, but they place it wrong. So we take her back home first night. We have all these boxes and cans of food. We've got this distributor of, uh, you know, it's kind of like an IV and we turn the machine on. We start turning that on that first night and she starts to panic. She's like, I don't know what's going on, Sean. Something's really wrong. I'm in all this pain. I I feel like my body's like on fire or something. And what was happening was the food was, the liquid was filling up around her organs, which will suffocate Mm -hmm. your organs and kill you quick. Oh my gosh. So we turn it off, throw it in our Honda Civic and just race to Everett Hospital about, you know, as closest one to our house. They get her stabilized. And then I followed the ambulance from there to Seattle, Washington, to Virginia Mason hospital in our Honda civic drive down and they get her stabilized. And we find ourselves in the hospital for six days. They had to cut her open, do our, the surgery clean Mm -hmm. out around all of her organs. And man, that kind of stuff, I'm still young. Like I'm, I'm like 27 and, and you're going through all the fear and like, God, why is this happening? But also like, man, what are we going to do? And I just felt this, I felt like I had an opportunity to really to either, get bitter or to get better. Mm -hmm. And I really felt God like saying like, you got to man up. Like you, you like, how are you going to provide for your family? How are you good? Cause I'm like, how are we going to do medical bills? Mm -hmm. How are we going to, you know, take care of this? We're dual income now. And I kind of been leaning on my wife, which I think is cool. It's a good cool synergy, but I'm like, like this, I don't know what the future, how are we going to raise a family? How are we going to pay the bills? Plus we're losing our homes because of the big short. Mm-hmm. And plus we're going to actually through drama at the church. Some, some of the senior leaders at the church, we out stole some money. And so the church was falling apart. Mm-hmm. So we have like loss of trust and leadership kind of, or just like, dang, that, that situation sucks. Where are we going to live? Our tenants in one house are not, not paying because they lost their job mm-hmm. in the great recession. And now I'm in the hospital for six days. So you can imagine this is like, just the pressure and the transformation of just in prayer and thought and worry. And interestingly enough, 
One of the days when my wife was sleeping, I go across the street to Barnes and Noble and I buy a copy of Success Magazine. And I bring that magazine back to the hospital room and it's when it had CDs in the middle. Yeah. I don't know if you're- Yeah, right. yeah, I remember that. Yep. Yeah. And, and I, I pulled a CD out and I put it in my HP laptop that's got like a seven, <laughs> the thing is like 48 pounds. And I put that in, in this laptop, put on the headphones and I listened to this really energetic, uh, you know, guy talking and it was Gary Vaynerchuk. This is oh, 2009. Yeah. yeah. And he had just wrote a book called Crush It. Why now is the time to cash in on your passion? Mm. And so the book was out because he's promoting his book. He's being right. interviewed and he's just talking about how, man, you got to get online and whether you start a blog or a YouTube channel or whatever. And then he starts talking about ways to monetize affiliate marketing or brand sponsorships or ads. And this is super early in the game, but I'm reading this and it's because of the circumstances we're in, I'm in a whole different level of desperation right. of receptivity and also of like, you know, fire and passion. Cause I've learned from that season that reasons come first results come second. Mm. And that when you're in a season where you may be complacent or it's easy to get complacent when everything is going well, it's mm -hmm. easy to just, why would you stretch and work all week at your day job? And then after work works as hard as it takes to grow an influence online or grow a YouTube mm. channel, you're going to talk yourself out of that work. And Netflix is going to be a lot more tempting but if you've got strong enough reasons, then that makes you say, man, what am I fighting for? And I know a lot of people want to start YouTube channels for like the fame or the fortune or the followers, which is all cool respect. But for me, now I'm fighting for my family. Now yeah. I'm like, okay, I, I, how do I pay these medical bills? How mm -hmm. do I actually get out of this circumstance? And I'm seeing, I'm connecting the dots now from the skills I've been to. I'm, I already started a YouTube channel three years earlier. I, I already have some gear for my video production business. So I'm reading every single word of this book, like with desperation. Mm. And, and I remember finishing the book. I didn't even really, it's in there, but I didn't like you, you're, you don't catch it all at once. I don't really have a game plan. I didn't have a roadmap. I didn't even really know what the next step was. I just remember the title. I was like, I'm going to crush it. Like that was, <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, thank you, Gary plan crush it. Like what's yeah. the plan? What are you going to do next? I don't know. Crush it. So I, I was at that moment that I made a decision to go all in a whole nother level of all in. Like I'm going to of course fight practically. I still would work day jobs and eventually we moved to Vegas and I was the director of communication at, at a church, which they had a TV show and some other things in the past. I had a pretty big brand. So I continued to learn but I work so hard on my side hustle and every spare minute. Cause that's what Gary Vee preaches too. He's like, yeah, you can build any business from 10 to two in the morning. Like just whatever you got to do during the day, this is the era where you can work on something like a YouTube channel. So that was, man, that was the spark. Mm. And, and that was, you know, 11 years ago. Um, and a lot of wanderings and mistakes and failures over, over the years. But that was the moment when it was like, dude, I got a freaking crush and I'm mm. going all in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, amazing story. First of all, yeah. I didn't know all that, but I mean, I get it. Like, Hey, I've got all these reasons. I've got my wife in the hospital where, you know, bills are tough. I get why you'd be motivated to do something, but why YouTube? Why did, why was that such a draw for you? I mean, at that time, I don't, I don't remember exactly what was going on in YouTube, but I mean, was there a path on how you make money off of YouTube? Why was YouTube such a big thing for you? There was. And so one of my favorite questions to ask if someone's trying to figure out how to make money online or work from home or become your own boss, something like that is what's the shortest path to revenue? Like, have you defined mm -hmm. based on what it is you want to do the shortest path to revenue? And what I discovered was from reading the book. And then from, I started to study everything, probably like a lot of people that listen to this, you get in that mode where now you're intentionally learning all yeah. that you can about, well, what are the ways to make money online? How, how do you get views? How do mm. you get subscribers? So on the one hand, it was YouTube as the traffic source, but the vehicle for making money was called affiliate marketing. And what affiliate marketing was in my case was knowing that you can sign up for a website like amazon.com and most, a lot of people shop on amazon.com. They already have their prime account. They're already there. Well, if someone's watching a YouTube video and you're signed up for what's called the Amazon associates program, and you're trying to determine, you know, what massage gun do I buy? Do I buy the Theragun massage gun? Cause you want to recover after a workout or uh, running, I'm a runner or mm -hmm. whatever, or do you, do you buy the uh, craft gun? And so people would go to YouTube 
Google told us 65% of people use YouTube to answer specific questions, in particular product related questions. Mm -hmm. If they click your link, that's to Amazon, they go to Amazon. If they purchase something, you get a percentage of that sale. And not only that, on Amazon in particular, for 24 hours, if they purchase anything after they've clicked your link, then you get a percentage of that sale. So what I realized was, well, I've been doing video for years now. Recently, I started a business and I took out a loan from this micro loan website called prosper.com for seven grand so I could buy a DSLR and I could buy some lenses and I could buy a video editing computer so I could start shooting wedding videos and whatnot. So I had mm. the gear. And I also was then like, I was like, wow, I could also monetize this in different ways. In addition to shooting a wedding video or doing client work, if I put a video on YouTube where I review this lens I just bought and I say, and hey, y'all, if you want to check out a review of this uh, or you, if you want to check out this lens out on, on Amazon where I got it, link in the description below. If someone clicks that link, well, I could make four bucks off that right. sale. Mm. But if 10 people do it, I could get 40. But what's crazy, if, if someone clicks that link and they're like, well, I'm not ready to buy a camera or a lens, but it is Christmas and I'm going to buy my husband a Brettling watch, then off that $3,000 watch, I'm actually going to get 200 bucks. Hmm. So, so I started actually noticing, wow, the more videos I put out there with affiliate links in the description and the more in particular kinds of videos, product tutorials, product reviews, in my zone of genius, which again, there's so many different ways to do this, but this was the path as mm -hmm. to your question mm -hmm. that I saw. I was like, okay, well, I know video and I could talk about gear, camera tutorials, what lights should you buy? What lenses should you buy? Um, and this camera versus that camera. And then I had a dream and I was like, these cameras are expensive, but what if, what if like the camera companies would send me the gear for free? Hmm. And that of course is these days is kind of influencer marketing. But once mm -hmm. you build up your influence in a particular niche, you're able to get all kinds of stuff for free. I mean, I just get sent lights and cameras and what, and that was, that was the dream of a kid like broke and months away from having zero in our bank account with my wife right. thinking about like, dang, I see the path. Like if I stick with this and I hustle in this. And I mean, one example, just to, just to kind of illustrate Heather Torres, who's our chief operating officer, she has a homeschool channel and it's, it's a more niche type of channel. It's under 20,000 subscribers, but even back before she only had 5,000 subscribers, when you grow a channel in a niche, a particular niche or niche, then brands and different people want to work with you. For example, her and her husband normally spend 1600 bucks a year on the curriculum for their homeschool. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, now that they have the channel, they just reached out and they're like, Hey, uh, we have this channel. Could we talk about it on the channel and whatnot? Would you be open to like kind of a, a brand influencer relationship? They're like, what's an influencer relationship? And she like explained it. They ended up getting the curriculum for free. So they saved $1,600. They set up an affiliate referral thing where if anyone bought that curriculum, they got 10% of that $1,600. That's $160 dollars every transaction and even on a small channel started to carve out so they were able to buy all their kids fire tablets and they pay for all their homeschool room and everything by just doing this in a niche and that's where I started as well I just started out small and used it as supplemental income and while we moved to Vegas and I had a salary and I was working at a church I started to make 200 bucks a month an extra 400 dollars a month fourth quarter when people are doing all kinds of online shopping 600, 800, a thousand dollars a month. Right. And so when I was able to jump off, I was actually also verifying kind of my dream job while I was working my day job and chipping away at it very much in the crush it model, like in extra hours. In some seasons, I couldn't even upload videos either because I was too exhausted or too busy or it's Easter or Christmas if you're in the church world. <laughs> but then some seasons I was like, dude, I'm going to grind all summer. Like I have a lightened schedule. And when I learned, and here's the other big secret really, or, or powerful point about YouTube is that because YouTube is a search engine, it's different than all the other platforms. YouTube is the only platform where your content lives forever. It's like a fine wine. It gets better with age. Mm -hmm. So when I would post a video about eventually the best camera for YouTube, and I would compare a couple different cameras, that video would be watched this month, next month. In those days, a year and a half later, two years later today, I have videos that are seven years old that still get views. So the reason YouTube, and I was seeing this stuff, not as clearly as I see it today, but without question, 
I've always been very kind of calculated Mm -hmm. in how I make my decisions. And one of my favorite things is leverage. I'm like, I would definitely love to like do something today that'll pay me tomorrow if I don't work. Mm -hmm. Every YouTube video that you put out that's strategic is like an employee you pay once, but then that works for you for free for weeks, months, and years to come. It's like your own Star Wars clone army where I've multiplied Sean and he's going out on the internet like little robot Sean's that are like, hey, do you want, about all kinds of different topics. And over the years I experimented in the health niche and in like CBD and in books and in a lot of stuff, especially because we help people with this stuff these days. So I like to verify software, uh, different things that are even outside of just direct video tools and things like that. And so that was the aha moment for me. YouTube is like digital real estate. It's an asset. You invest in it today. And over the years, it builds up this snowball. When you buy a house today, good real estate, I could have, if we could have hung onto those houses today, those houses would have been doubled. So it's like building up that digital real estate on YouTube. So how much went into the planning? Once you figured that model out, that that thought process out of, okay, I'm going to put this out there and this is digital real, real estate. How much planning went into that? Because you start to see a lot of that's on YouTube. There's no planning. It's just throw it out there and let's go. You know, so what was that like? Were you in the house thinking about, okay, this is what I'm going to do in front of the camera. Cut. I'm going to edit this and do it this and that. I mean, what was that like for you? So the way it makes it sound right now, I wouldn't want that to even discourage anyone to be like, dang, homeboy's calculated. And like, he was like dialed in into, no, in 2010, I was not dialed in. I'm like reverse. I I saw the North star, but then I wandered in the desert quite a bit because (laughs) I just started shooting videos, man. I mean, your first videos are your worst videos. It, like I didn't even actually focus. Ironically, I started Think Media, but I kind of backburnered it. It was my v- most valuable aus- asset, like in terms of expertise, which was cameras and lighting. But I kind of punted it. I wanted, I got sort of tempted to want to kind of be a vlogger. Mm-hmm. And so I just started making random videos about like my dogs. And then my wife and I would like go on a date. And by the way, update is like, what is crazy is, is by really a miracle. Her health's in an incredible place, some incredible surgeries. We never thought we'd be able to have a family. Mm -hmm. So now that I've got a four month old son, it is just incredible to see Mm -hmm. God's grace and what has happened over a decade. Uh, And she's doing uh, amazing right now. But, you know, I really, you can go to my early videos. I reviewed the amazing Spider-Man and then I did a cooking video and then I filmed my dogs with like no point and no storyline and no point to the video. And then I got a droid X and like, went to Vegas before I lived here and like filmed the tram and uploaded it. Like it was just total chaos. And I actually do think there's something about um, when you hear me talk now, you're like, dang, I better have every, all my ducks in a row. I think there's something about entrepreneurship and YouTube that is like ready, fire, aim. Right. Yeah. Like get ready Mm -hmm. on a napkin plan, jump out, And of course you got to aim as you go. You'll steer as you go because in hindsight, I look back, I'm like, wow, I could have done it clearer, maybe more strategic, but I don't know. I maybe if I would have been in an analysis paralysis the whole time, Mm. I maybe never would have actually Uh, taken action. And it was the forward momentum that I was able to, you can't steer a parked car. Right. Right. You needed to start. You just had to start whatever, whatever it took to get there. The question I do have, because you mentioned something earlier about, you know, you were working two jobs. You were working, the day job was at church, and then you were splitting time and then uh, doing your waiting creative tables, work. Yeah, yeah, waiting tables, creating. Then you did your creative work at the end. When did it happen to you? When did it come to you to say, you know what? I need to pour all 100% of me into what you are currently doing today. So when I look back at 2010 with what I know now, and you could never really, you know, know for sure, I think I was still afraid of stepping out. As I mentioned earlier, there was wanting to learn, but also being afraid to be the guy. And you can see that in my early videos. I was kind of like in my show, my first video was super weird. I like temper my personality and I like don't, I, I, cause I, you know, you're afraid of being judged. You're just afraid of coming off weird. You, you just don't know how to manage your energy or whatever. So I still stayed, in, I think there's two things. I still felt like I was in a preparation season. May, cause if I look back, when I started Think Media in 2010, if I would have went all in in that moment, I would have been fine. If I could have known the, even mm-hmm. if I was willing to like go in debt, it right. actually would have been a smart move in my opinion, because 
with knowing where YouTube is going, although I did not know where YouTube is going. The second thing was out of responsibility to my wife and wanting to be a man, and I believe actually make the right decision, I did end up getting a full-time job. And I think that was the right move because it was, it came with healthcare and that was, that was the priority that I was putting first. I, w- I didn't want to bet my side hustle. If I was a single dude, the debt move might've been, you know, Hey, just trust me. But obviously that's a lot of risk. Mm-hmm. So I think you have to be careful with risk depending on your dependence and your situation. And a door opened to move to Vegas, to work at a church, be a director of communications. Now in hindsight too, my friend, Ken Coleman, from the Dave Ramsey team wrote a book called the proximity principle. And what was beneficial though, of all this stuff was in everything that I'm doing today, getting around people who are kind of like walking in what you want to do in the future can help. And for me, that was public speaking, writing books. Um, and so also becoming a part when we moved to Vegas, the church was a mega church, larger church TV show. Mm. Uh, I was, I was helping the pastor with this personal brand and I did know someday I really did want to do my personal brand. Uh, do I do it now? I'm still kind of timid, but I'm, I'm running Facebook ads. I'm doing a lot of things that we do at scale today. So it's still very much a learning season. And, uh, as far as, so could I have jumped out? Sure, maybe, but I wanted to be faithful in that season, you know, make sure that we had the base of health insurance and take care of my wife and, and learn everything I could in that season and devote my extra time and punt a lot of leisure and hobbies to build my YouTube channel up. But the turning point for me was if you fast forward to 2015, I eventually ended up doing freelance work full-time, three clients. $2,000, $2,000 and 1,000 from one of the clients, 60,000 a year. We we're living in Vegas, my wife and I, I work from home. I'm able to work on my YouTube channel, but that client work does keep me pretty busy. Mm-hmm. He's basically like having three bosses. And so I'm doing stuff for them. And then October, 2015 rolls around and I'll never forget the first week I get a call. Hey, Sean, you know, we got to let you go not a big deal. You know, we're hiring some full-time people. We're restructuring. That's the way it goes. You're, mm-hmm. you're, it's client work. You're on your off. Okay, cool. So I lose two grand. All right. No big deal. Um, second week though, bring, Hey, Sean, got to let you go. That was the second $2,000 mm. client. Okay. $4,000 of income lost. Okay. We got 1000 consistent coming. Now, mind you, YouTube's bringing in like three fifty a month. And as I mentioned around the holidays, around a grand, mm-hmm. but third week phone rings, God is my witness. I'm like, you know what? I know what you're going to say. Like I, you know, the way this month is going, Sean, we got to let you go. So we lose like 80, 90% of our income in three weeks time, Mm. October, 2015. So the fourth week of October was Netflix wine and depression. But the, but the first week of November (laughs) was total clarity of, dude, I got to go all in on this. And I remember I called David Goldstein, this uh, friend of mine, kind of a business mentor, a guy from church. And, and I remember he goes, I go, David, I'm worried. I lost my clients. I don't really know what to do. I've got some momentum online. And at the time I have 16,000 subscribers on mm, Think Media, mm-hmm. a lot, but not, I mean, today it's mm-hmm. 1.6 million. So, right. um, and I go, David, I'm super worried. Now, David has like built and sold companies. He's like independently wealthy. He just does whatever he wants all day long. And, and uh, like consults businesses. And he's like, you know, Sean, I'm not worried. And I go, well, that's about the most offensive thing you could possibly <laughs> say, David, because I know, I know you're not worried. Like I've never seen you worried. Like you have, you have like F you money, bro. Like, right. you're ne- <laughs> of course you're not you worried. Not? Of course you're not worried. That is not why I called you. I called, like, I am worried. And last time I checked, with as much money as you have, you don't pay my bills for me. Right. <laughs> so David, listen, I am worried. I think you misunderstood me, but uh, I'm so glad he said that because he, uh, he was like, no, I mean, literally as an entrepreneur, at some point you have to jump off the cliff, bro. Mm-hmm. I think God just kicked you off the cliff. Like right. it's been your time to fly. You just got to go all in. And he was mm-hmm. so right. And that's why when I look back, I think, okay, could I've probably done it earlier? Sure. And I think there's, there's, you need that self-awareness between risk and family and are you ready? And you might right. fail and you probably will, but it's, but that was, it was a magical moment because all that preparation and all the learnings and all the things I had done and all the seasons of service, I, d- I went all in 
And now it was so freeing. I actually, as soon as he kind of like gave me permission that I could have just chosen myself and given right. myself permission, I felt like it was Christmas since then. I still feel like it's Christmas day every time I woke mm. up because I don't have a boss. I am I'm truly my own boss. And I was like, even though we're actually broke in this moment and we're about six months away from zero in our bank account, I don't, I get to get up every day and create. And so I started to work 60, 70, 80 hour weeks to get, to try to make it work. And from November 1st, 2015 to January 1st, 2016, the check I got from the Amazon affiliate program that in January was $4,500 and the YouTube AdSense revenue I made was about a thousand dollars. So we had replaced 60 K income starting out that next year, mm. all online. Wow. And then from there, it got great. That first year was multiple six figures. Second year was like 700, eight, uh, seven or 800 K. The next year was in the seven figures. Now we're multiple seven figures. And, and so it's been like crazy snowball of momentum and it's been overnight success. Mm. But what people know is that overnight success <laughs> yeah. takes freaking 10 to 15 years. Right. And that was just like the floodgates opening because all the leadership and the teamwork and the studying and the doing the client work, I just started to deploy it uh, really on my own channels. And that was kind of where it went next. So you mentioned 60, 70, 80 hours a week when that was your only focus. What were you doing in that time? Like what, what did those hours make up of? So one of the key principles to winning on YouTube is research before you press record. Research before you press record. The mistake people make is they go, okay, I'm gonna shoot a video. They shoot a video, they maybe edit it or they just record and then they upload it. And then they go, okay, what should I title this? Uh, okay, <laughs> and if, if you do some research then, you maybe didn't make the video right for like the title you discover. And here's, here's the, 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 for anyone that's new for this, it's called like keyword research. What you can do is keyword research. A keyword is diet. A keyword phrase is best diets for women over 50. So think about it. If you were going to make a YouTube video, a good YouTube video would be called best diets for women over 50. And maybe a woman is teaching this channel. She's sharing how to, you mm -hmm. know, she's got a specific audience. She's mm -hmm. creating a specific video. Here's the key. What a lot of people do is they're like, they make their diet video and they're like, oh, cool. If they learn about what I'm teaching here, then they go, well, let me just throw this title on there. Well, no, the title would have informed the content you created. Right. In fact, if you, you could look up, if you start typing in YouTube, if you want to see where you could get some title ideas, when you start typing in the YouTube search bar or Google, it finishes your sentence for you, right? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that before? Yes. You start typing. Yes. When it finishes your sentence for you, those are actual exact sentences or phrases that YouTube would be telling you people are actually searching for. So when you type in how to hide a dead body, you know, one of the questions a lot of us have, like if you type in how to lose, it'll say like, wait. Right. And then if you put in another space, it'll say like fast or so what's really interesting though, is if you go down that you go down the list, cause there's like 50 predictions at the bottom, how to lose weight fast, for wrestling. Hmm. Now you're into the magic of where you can really win on YouTube because you want to answer specific questions. You try to make a video on how to lose weight in a 2021 world. Right. There's so much competition, but even more so Google wants to serve up and rank videos. This is how your videos are viewed for weeks, months, and years to come that when you research before you press record, you go, okay, well, of course I'm a wrestling coach. I'm going to have a wrestling tips channel, help people get in shape, help them win. So how to lose weight fast for wrestling. Of course, I could definitely talk. I got five tips on that. Well, you researched before you press record. So Darren and uh, Ben, what I was doing was I was researching and trying to identify the best video ideas I could come up with. I would identify the next four that I should shoot and create like potentially the most that would help people that people. Now I would use a keyword research tool. What's even, you could get something like vidIQ or Uber suggest, which is uh, it'll show you the volume of people searching per month on right. Google. And when you, when you start knowing now you can know, okay, wow, wow. 10,000 people a month search for this 30,000 a month search for this. So if you rank a video, you could get 10,000 views a month for the next 12 months because of making the right video about the right topic. So I was trying to verify intent of, is there an audience for this? Uh, what are the most popular topics? What should I title my videos? 
And what are some of like, where's my energy just best spent? Cause right. I could make a hundred different videos, but what are the 10 I should make? And then I'm at the intersection of what do I also know how to make? Like, so this is like, well, that's a great title, but I have no idea how to lose weight fast for wrestling. I've never done that. Right. It's like, but for me, it'd be like, okay, I'm less on photography. I'm more on videography. Oh, how to best camera settings for shooting outdoors. I'm like, frick easy. So, so I researched first, got my title, planned mm, it out. Yep. And then I brainstorm my content around that. And then what I would do is batch producing. So when possible, now keep in mind, I now am very comfortable at shooting, editing, and producing videos. Yeah. This is 2015, this is 20, you know, 15, end of their 2016. And I've been doing it since 2003. So I, whatever the math is, that's 14 years. So I'm, I'm fast at editing, shooting, and even like understanding, getting the camera and the lighting, right. That's also what the channel is about. It's meta, but that it was really my background, like mm -hmm. video, teaching video, doing video. But when I would batch produce, it's never a good idea. Once you get comfortable, if you're going to set the lighting up and take a shower that day and get dressed <laughs> and, you know, and actually like, get that, that double shot latte exactly. and like really get your head in the game. Dude, why are you only shooting one video? Like why not shoot two, three or four? Mm. So batch producing is I would do my research phase, come up with the next four, sometimes even five or six videos. Then on a separate day, I do that on a Thursday, on a Friday, I would get, I would sit down, set up the camera, the lighting, the batteries, the SD cards, get it all out. And I would shoot five or six videos all in a row. Then they're all saved on the camera, shoot the thumbnails. And then I would go to editing and throw those in the timeline. Cause keep in mind, I'm doing everything by myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have no clients anymore, but I'm also, at, there's no, like nobody helping with editing. There's nobody like, it's right. just me. My wife does. She's always been our CFO. She does the books, but as far as the content creator, the personality, you, you are, like the credits at the end of a movie, when you're a solo YouTube creator, you're all of them. You're like, I'm, I'm the, the, the gaffer. I did the gaff tape. I, I'm the lighting guy. I'm the videographer, you know, there's no I'm, one to blame. There's no one to blame. Yeah, that's you. a blessing and a curse. <laughs> I'm also, you're also the marketer. So I would, I would edit the videos, upload them. Then I do the title description tags, thumbnail. Then I would put it out there and then I would share it. Then I would like go on social media and share it on Facebook and share it on Twitter. And then I would do it again for every video. And so to me, out of that desperate season, like you said, what was I doing for 70, uh, 80 hours a week was as many videos as possible. Mm -hmm. And the other mm -hmm. huge motivating factor, which had become clear to me at this exact moment was God's plan. Come on, Drake. I, I was, <laughs> I was literally like, dude, it's November. And every year previous, I would go all in around Black Friday, Cyber Monday, because online income, particularly with affiliate marketing, doesn't just double. It's sometimes 4Xs or 10Xs wow, yeah. during this time. So there was the extra spark. I was like, even if I slow down in January, I got to put out, if I can put out a video a day, which by yourself is almost impossible, mm -hmm. but I'm probably doing three, four videos a week every single week in November, every, the first three weeks in December until we chill a little for Christmas and then we're back at it. And it was that much momentum that got me from about $400 in affiliate income to that check of $4,500. But the cool thing was because of the research and because of ranking videos, it, it wasn't like, even as I started to, if you will, slow down or change my energy to like, okay, now I need a videographer now, or now I need someone to help editing. Now, how do I scale? How do I build? it doesn't just always go back to zero. In a lot of ways, you are not trading your time for money. The time you invest, all that hustle, if done right, and it's not on every video, right. but if done right on the videos that break out, they become assets to where your baseline of mm. ad revenue and yep. YouTube revenue, when done right, depending on the niche, um, we'd start having 5,000 come in no matter what. I could take two weeks now later that year with my wife and still not have her income go down because the videos kept being watched. And that's because of really, it's something that we have kind of become known for as our proprietary process. We teach it as like the seven R system. And I'll tell you what the seven R's are, but like there um, is as ranking videos <laughs> as assets that keep getting views for weeks, months, and years to come. Yeah. Random but related question, because I've got this theory about hard work, 
and I'm wondering if you'll validate that for me. What was your mentality? You know, you're talking about 60, 70, 80 hours, hour, 80 hours a week and you're doing all this research, but did it feel like work or were you just so pumped to do it and your why was so strong enough that it didn't even feel like you were just so jacked up to, to get after it? No, I mean, I think when you're fueled by gratitude and when you're doing something you love to do, yeah. it did not feel mm. like work. Yeah. On the flip side, yeah, I mean, it did at some time. Sure. Sometimes sure. you're, you know, it's friggin' 1145 PM and you're like, you know what, like, like Jack Nicholson, man, all work, no play makes, <laughs> you know, hopefully you don't murder your family, but right. like ultimately the shining is like, you know, you need a break. Like yeah. you, there's sometimes when you need a break, but no, I, I think just to, to rabbit trail on that a second, you know, it's interesting. Um, I want to write a book and I don't actually know if I want to write this book, but here's what the book would be titled. It'd be called creative dad, hard ass dad, mm. because we probably all know rich dad, poor dad. Yes. Mm-hmm. But, uh, my parents got divorced when I was three. My mom remarried when I was seven. Um, my biological father, love him artist, like real artists, like woodworker does all kind of this, like weaving wood, but has always struggled financially and was real. Like when they got divorced, I mean, was struggling with cocaine addiction and was struggling mm. with uh, some abuse and some different things. And then they didn't pay child support and whatnot. And eventually, thank God, I mean, we, we have got a good relationship today. And, um, and I learned so much about music and art and creativity, but I'll tell you what, I'm 37 years old and this might sound like I'm like, I'm just one of those old school guys. I was lacking what many are today, real work ethic. Mm -hmm. And a lot of creatives lack, this is why they're starving artists because you're an artist, but you didn't know how to actually go out and get it and hustle and grind. And, And he just never did super passive about things. And so my dad comes into my life, stepdad, Phil, and he's the hard ass dad. And he's almost the opposite extreme. You've got my dad who's super passive. And Phil, I remember one time I was riding my Huffy bike <laughs> and I was, I was, I was pumping. And I remember there was this little dish ditch of, of, uh, that I was going to like Ollie over. I'm going to jump over it, yeah. you know? And I'm like, I get these big ideas. I think I can fly. I'm pumping my, my Huffy bike. I like lift the front wheel as if I'm going to, I don't even, the wheel doesn't even <laughs> come off the it ground. Does, it just goes straight into the ditch tire hits, I fall face forward, hit my head on a rock, start to cry, losing my mind. And I remember my stepdad, Phil comes up, comes out and he goes, shut the hell up. And I remember I go, I stopped crying. And I was like, okay, I'll stop crying. And that sounds pretty harsh, but I was like, thank you. I don't have to cry. Now, mind you, I wasn't like bleeding. Like, right, like, right. I'm not going to take you to the hospital. I was, uh, I was, I was being raised and I'm not trying to get controversial, but I was being raised by just my mom. Right. And I was a little sissy. Soft. Man. Yeah. You're a little soft. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's understood. And I said it with the FT on it. You know that, right? It's soft. That's, yeah. why, that's why you were soft too, right? <laughs> but that's right? the truth, man. I mean, it, you're right, man. And, and you, and, and you at least admit it, but, there are people that are out there that just don't have that work ethic. And anytime they hit an obstacle, what do they do? Yeah. They want to fold. They want to quit. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. They, Been there. and then they got to reset all over again, man. No, no, no. Keep, get up, get up the ground. And, and as your stepdad said, yeah. shut up, man. Shut, shut up. up crying, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I see people today. They're like, I posted two videos. I, you know, I like, I can't believe I haven't got the subscriber. Somebody that this happens all the time. Someone will get on, we do all these Q and A's and this is said with love and empathy for our whole community, but someone will be like, Sean, I've been posting for six weeks. I've posted three videos and I just don't think this is working. And I'm like three videos. Like shut the hell up, dude. This is working. Like, what are you talking about? Like get out of the ditch, get back on your huffy bike and keep riding. And so anyways, uh, to your point, Ben, I think that, yeah, that, work ethic, that grit, that was, and, and I want to say with respect and honor to both of my dads that it actually made me incredibly dynamic Mm -hmm. because there's the art and the creativity side that needs that work ethic and that grit side. And that becomes the ultimate combo for YouTube. And, and so, yeah, not only did it not feel like work out of gratitude and out of what I had known, I even sometimes think, and, and again, it's still work and you need to have mental health and you need to pace yourself and you should have re- rest and relaxation. But there's a part of me that's like, 
what are you talking about? You complaining influencers. Mm. You talk to a camera and edit on a laptop in Belize. And you're just <laughs> complaining about how hard your freaking life is. Dude, I, I've waited tables and washed dishes. And when we grew up on six acres, I, I mowed I mowed three lawns. I had my lawnmower that was push, my riding lawnmower for our bigger field, and a tractor with the mower deck for our six hours of grass. Dude, I've mowed some, and a weed eater for the edge of it. I've done four different modalities of cutting freaking grass. You're telling me I'm gonna sit in my loft, talk to a camera, upload it on YouTube, and have Amazon and YouTube send me checks while I get cameras from companies and what and i and i'm it's one thing when someone's starting and they're putting in the grind mm. whenever i hear like an influencer complain mm. i'm like dude what are you talking about <laughs> you entitled little i mean let's just keep it <laughs> keep so, it pg <laughs> <laughs> no and that's such a good perspective i mean and we said it in an instant gratification world where you can literally have food delivered to your door you don't have to wait on anything anymore it is hard i, I get it i mean it's hard to remember that things take time. So I'm totally with you on, yeah, it's, it's patience, but man, when you put so much effort into something and you're not seeing immediate results, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is, it does mess with you mentally, but it is good to hear that perspective. Hey man, th these things take, you've been doing this since 2003. I mean, it's easy to look at your channel now and say, Hey, he's got 1.6 million subscribers, but you've been doing this for so long. And so what do you tell, so, you know, 2015 to now, you've, like we've talked about, you've grown your following. Now you're helping people grow their followings. What do you tell people when they're first starting out? What's your first piece of advice? They've got the equipment. They're ready to press play. From a mental perspective, what do you tell people? And you haven't gone over to the seven R's either, right? So, you know, you mentioned that earlier, the seven R's. Yeah, I, I want, yeah I bring want, me back to that yeah, in a sec. yeah. Go ahead. So, I mean, the first thing I tell people is your first videos are going to be your worst videos. Like you got to start before you're ready. Ready is a lie. Like you got to start poop mm. your pants, scared, sweaty armpits, thinking about if I upload this video on, on the internet, Sarah from high school might see it and she'll like judge me. And then, and then like, I mean, cause I've seen her like posting on Instagram, like her photos and things. And like, she'll probably judge me with where I'm at in my life. So what dude, Sarah's not even paying attention to you anymore. <laughs> and why do you care about what Sarah thinks? But you're going to have the mental battles. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. You're going to have the perfectionism battles of like, mm -hmm. Oh, it's not quite perfect yet. And I look at Sean's videos or I look at Darren's videos and I, and I just, I'm not that yet. You, you can't compare yourself. You can't overthink it. You got to just punch fear in the face, punch perfectionism in the face and start. And I would encourage you to try to post 30 videos, not focused on any kind of results goals, but just output goals. Mm. You know, you would especially respect this, right? Cause you understand, you know, results goals would be, I hope I can actually run that, that, that mile at a certain time. I hope I actually could actually, you know, hit these particular stats. Well, you can't always control your results goals. You could set those, but your output goals, like one of my output goals, I'm not super serious, obviously, cause I'm not getting the, like the, the benefit yet, but it's to be Brad Pitt fight club ripped. Mm. Right. I mean, one of that's one of my. Yeah. Goals. Why are you laughing, yeah. Derek? No, he was lean, brother. I remember that. I Dude, this, it not hey, too long. He you just know. poured his soul, but that's one of his goals. And you're sitting there laughing I'm at just him. Saying, I'm Sorry, I Sean. That. Go ahead, Sean. <laughs> right, right. And Good so, luck with that one. <laughs> And so, well, but, but people have different genetics. They have different things going on. So I might not be able to actually say that the only goal is my body's going to look like him. But if I measure output goals, mm -hmm. I could commit to working out and lifting something heavy for an hour a session, three times a week. And then the byproduct of the output goals. So on YouTube, I want people to focus on head down. I want you to upload 30 videos without even caring about your subscribers. You don't want to go six weeks in. Is this working? It is working. Because it's not actually about how it's working in terms of external re results. It's working on you. You got to use your season in obscurity to prepare you for popularity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's actually forming you and getting you into a cadence of creating content, getting over some of those mental battles. So that's what I tell people to start. Keep it simple. Just start mm -hmm. with your smartphone. In fact, I, I want people listening to this to post your first video today. Mm -hmm. Grab your smartphone, turn it you know, horizontal, point it at yourself and just say, Hey, um, Sean here. I was listening to this uh, podcast today and I'm starting a YouTube channel. Uh, this is weird. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to be talking about gardening and, uh, because I, I love gardening. Like you just start and no yeah. editing, 
You don't need little social media icons mm. to point out and opening theme music and all that other stuff. Complexity is the enemy of execution. You can add the fancy stuff oh. later. Oh, that's good. Start yeah. simple. Yes. Mm. And just get started. Yeah. No, I, I mean, outcome, I'm sorry, output goals versus outcome goals. You've said a lot of awesome things. I think I'm probably going to take that away the most. That That's awesome. Such good advice. And But you... Well, let's circle back to the seven R's. R's. Yeah, we about. need to talk about the seven R's, man. You, you mentioned it earlier. Can you give us, elaborate on, on, on that as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's the seven R's. Number one, reverse engineer. Number two, research before you press record. I'll go through them twice. Number three, record. Mm. Number four, release. Number five, rocket and rank your videos. Number six, review. Number seven, repeat. So number one, reverse engineer. I think this is the ultimate tip in any endeavor because it's starting with the end in mind. And here's the questions you'd ask. What's the point of my YouTube channel? Like, who is it that I want to reach? What would winning look like? It's kind of high level. Mm -hmm. You also say, what's the point of this video? Not every video has the same intent. Is the video meant to rank, uh, recommend an affiliate product and make money? Is the video meant to go deeper with your subscribers? You might title the video like channel update, you know, update from Sean. Well, that's probably not going to do super well, but the purpose of the video was to talk to the people who already. So, right. so what's the purpose of the video? What is the purpose of the channel? And then how's this video going to make money? Just starting with the end in mind. And no matter what you're doing in business and in life, it, you always are going to make better decisions. If you start with the end in mind and work mm -hmm. backwards. Mm -hmm. Number two is research before you press record. At this stage, now you're doing keyword research and your goal is to define the title and the thumbnail before you even shoot your video. Right. You're going to have a huge advantage if you think about what is the compelling idea, what is the title, and it'll help even more if there's keyword research and that's getting into some of the more tactics. But now, not only do you understand the purpose of the video, but you're actually dialing in specific research to verify, and I, this is, I, I'm sure, how people think. Is this going to be worth my time? Is it? <laughs> am I going to get the most bang for my buck in putting my energy into this video? So now you know that, like, well, if I'm going to make this video on five tips for helping you lose weight fast for wrestling, you're like, well, that's a really clear idea. Now, what's the thumbnail going to be? Okay, cool. I haven't even pressed record yet. So when I go into number three, record, this is now you're going to sit down and record your video. You have outlined it a little bit. You know what the big idea is. And so for the record phase, outline your video. I don't script my videos, but I do bullet points. And, and so I know in a good example, five ways to lose face weight fast for wrestling. Number one, uh, you know, go running with the saran wrap around you or whatever. <laughs> Number two. And so you know what the five tips are and you just, you, you might just write those on your phone. You don't have to do right. some major big script. Like you just are organizing your ideas ahead of time. You also no, don't just shoot your video, but you also maybe do photography for your thumbnail in that moment because you've already thought through it. An afterthought is someone goes, oh yeah, YouTube thumbnails are important. Mm -hmm. You've already defined at least right. the concept. Like, let me make sure I take a picture or, or like pull one. So then you record your video. Next one's release. This is getting it ready to be released to the world. So you're going to title it, description, tags, end cards, cards. That's a lot, especially if you're new to YouTube, but it's that phase of optimizing the video and getting it ready to be made public. The next one's rocket. And now you want to release it to the world and rocket it out there. It's like a, a space launch and, and you're, you're shooting your video out there. And then your goal is if you've done everything right up until this point, because you've researched well, there's good tags. It might just perform well on its own. Mm -hmm. Once you've done YouTube for a while, when you look in the back end, you can actually see there's like the YouTube analytics actually are like this blue line shooting the video out. And sometimes it flatlines and doesn't quite break through the atmosphere. But your goal is to actually have the video keep going. And that's what can happen is it keeps being suggested and recommended by the algorithm and showing up in search. So a, a true successful rocket launch is a video that flies on forever, mm -hmm. you know, until the next generation to a galaxy far, far away. I just mixed up references there, <laughs> but ultimately the video just shoots <laughs> off and keeps on, keeps on going. And, and then, and then some don't, some, it, you'll see a little arc. They're like, and it's not a dud, but it just kind of flatlines. It, right. it, it reaches maybe a few mm -hmm. subscribers and then you just get back at it. So the seven R's are a system that you repeat over and over again. 
And then the other thing though, when you're rocketing it is yes, it may do well up until this point, but now, especially when you're starting, it's time to do hand to hand social media combat. It's time to do whatever you can to burn as much jet fuel to get viewership around this video. So I'm going to share it on Twitter. If I have Instagram stories, it's up to you. You don't have to do Mm -hmm. all of these. I post it on my LinkedIn wall. I go on my Instagram stories. I'm like, Hey, new video out today. Swipe up. Maybe you don't have the swipe up feature, put the video in your Instagram bio, put your YouTube channel in your email signature, according to your niche. Cause you want people to be aware of your YouTube channel, get on Reddit. If there's a certain conversation you should be in referencing your YouTube video, jump on clubhouse, a new trending app, and maybe people follow. So it's actually leveraging all of the tools that you have. Listen, here's the mentality. Go door to door, right? Go into right. your neighborhood, knock, knock. Hey, is anybody here? Watch YouTube. Dude, why the heck are you on my porch, man? This is a <laughs> pandemic. Why, why aren't you wearing two masks? The CDC just updated. <laughs> and so, but it, but it's this idea of you got to grind, especially early on. You got to go for it. And if you believe, if you opened up a coffee shop in a local town and, and you were small town rules talking to everybody, you'd be telling everybody, hey, come by the new shop. Yeah. Come out my new shop. So so you want to attract the right subscribers to be cl- clear here. You actually don't want people subscribing that aren't going to still be interested in it, mm. but or, or long-term interested in your channel, because that doesn't actually help you. If like your mom subscribes, but she never clicks on your video, that's not helping the algorithm. But if there's anyone in your world who drinks coffee, you're going to tell them about your new coffee shop right. that you mm-hmm. just opened up. So you do whatever you can to spread the word. Then the next one's review. And I would encourage you on this R, post your first 30 videos before you worry too much about this. But this is where you review your analytics. The definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Mm. So once you've got enough of a sample size of videos, you go back and success leaves clues. What can I learn from my analytics? Which topics did best? What, how, like there's even audience graphs, retention graphs. Mm. Wow. People watch the beginning, but I lo- they lose their attention when I do this segment of my video. This all sounds kind of complex, but you can learn little by little, a little bit per day. And this is why it's also a system. It's like a cycle. And then finally is repeat uh, the final R because you want to repeat more intelligently next time. Mm-hmm. Now, after what did you learn from that entire process? What did you learn? If the video did really well, should you make a part two? That's a huge way to follow up a banger mm-hmm. video because, because someone loved the fact that you just talked about de, uh, decluttering your closet. So their next video is about best tools for decluttering your closet. And everyone who loved that first one's being recommended the second. Should I make a part two? Should I not make that topic and maybe pivot topics? Um, how could I be more intelligent next time? Because I'm more comfortable on camera and shoot a batch of videos. What series should I make? next, which, what did I learn from my analytics and reviewing my videos? Wow. That was very profitable. So it's, it's thinking about ways to repeat more intelligently. And we go super deep Mm -hmm. in our content on all of the R's. This was kind of the surface level, but then you go back through them. So even if that, that was a lot, and that's something to re-listen to on the podcast, but like you then go, okay, review that's over my head, man. I don't even know what I'm looking at. You just keep doing it. If you do those seven R's each week, even you could do the rapid level. Like you could do this in an hour, mm-hmm. like reverse engineer real quick, get a concept, write the things on a stick, sticky note, shoot a five minute video on your phone, no editing, upload it, type in the title. You can do the seven R's like in a quick format, or you could get super fancy and make it as long as you want. But the more you go through and the more you keep looking at the data, what gets measured gets improved. You start to see trends. You start to notice things. It'll start to steer and, and help you make data driven decisions so that your next content is more informed and more strategic. And if you use that seven R system and commit to posting a video a week and then have the grit and the determination to just keep going deeper and, and learning and continuing to study and whatnot, you can get crazy results on YouTube. And that kind of brings some structure and some organization yeah. to it. Right. Yeah. Love right. that. I got, no, I got, we're not done yeah. yet, man. I got well, <laughs> some yeah. questions. Well, we're, right. we're winding down soon. We but. are winding down. So, look, I, I mean, we've seen the this, you know, YouTube be pioneered, and now you're seeing so many young kids that are out there, you know, creating their own channels and, and influencers creating their own channels. But now you're starting to see corporate America really take a hold of what's going on. Have you, are you starting to be approached more by, by corporate America now, as far as what their content should look like? And are you consulting with some of these, uh, these big uh, e-commerce companies? 
Yeah. Um, one of the places where, yeah, this has happened a couple of times recently, people that are in, um, I think it was outdoor supplies was a conversation I was having, having recently. Um, there's also different ways this is happening. A friend of mine, Jeremy Vest, who's also does YouTube advice. He helped a brand named Kingston, which mm-hmm. does memory and hard drives, but they didn't have a face. So they, they were a brand, but what they did was they hired a, um, somebody who already had a YouTube channel, Trisha Hershberger as talent to represent them. So absolutely brands are trying to figure out because I think that's the big question too. How does the brand become what is actually typically a lot more successful as being a personality? Mm -hmm. So do you promote from within? Do you recognize and, and maybe do you create a team brand and have multiple people represent the brand on your YouTube channel? Do you identify a face of the brand? And there is something about the personal brand inside of the corporate brand Um, but yeah, I think brands are trying to figure it out. And in answer to your question though, there's not a ton doing it. Well, it's me. It's a lot of the personal brands Mm. that are winning the most on YouTube. So Mm. I think company brands, team brands or whatever, trying to figure out how to, how to do it. Yeah. Mm. That's awesome. That's good. So as we wind down here, we, we obviously, I mean, this was, you know, tons of good information in this, but we want to point people toward, towards your channel or your channels. So where can people find you on YouTube? What's the main, the, the best resource to learn more about you? Yeah, 100%. I appreciate it. Um, if you type in think space media on YouTube, um, that will be the start of the journey and it'll bring up the YouTube channel. And, um, uh, my name is Sean Cannell rhymes with YouTube channel mm. and S E A N C A N N E L L. I'm everywhere on social and try to be as active and answering people's questions on Twitter, Instagram. And so those are the ones. And then uh, probably one of the best ways to, to start is I wrote a book called YouTube secrets and, but you can actually grab the audio book free tube secrets, audio.com. That's T U B tube secrets, audio.com. Or if you already have an audible account, you know, you, it could be one of your credits. Of course, It's on Amazon and all the other formats, but people love audiobooks. I love audiobooks when I'm, you know, walking the dog, doing stuff around the house right. or getting ready in the morning. So yeah, YouTube secrets, um, is just kind of a great way. It's probably the most cohesive step-by-step plan to just jump in and, uh, and start on YouTube. And I encourage people, I mean, there's so much opportunity on YouTube. Yeah. Um, the CEO, Susan Wojcinski just wrote a letter and she actually calls it the YouTube economy. She said the YouTube economy is live and well and flourishing. The amount of channels that were monetized doubled this past year over the year Mm. before. Listen to this. The YouTube economy is responsible for generating over $19 billion in the U.S. last year, which is equivalent of 345,000 full-time jobs. Um, It was a significant part of the global GDP. In UK, it was 30,000 jobs. In France, it was 15,000 jobs equivalent of what the YouTube economy is producing. Signal Fire released a blog on the creator economy. It went wider, TikTok, Instagram. But there's about 12 million people who consider themselves use YouTube creators. They said that number is going to double over the next couple of years. And listen to this. It's the fastest growing small business type. Mm. Mm. Wow. And, and this is this is a deep research article. And so people that are working from home, and I think the thing is like, looking at it, well, I don't know if I'm just going to be like a famous personality. No, people are doing crafting and using their YouTube channel to go to their Etsy shop. Uh, Mike from Stone Coat Countertops, they do epoxy countertops in a local business, but they started doing DIY free YouTube videos, selling the epoxy countertop kits on their website, and then also doing brand deals and all kinds of other things as their channel grew. Mary, who's like one of our students, she is in her legacy years, baby boomer, started from zero. She's at almost 300,000 subscribers, got her silver play button. She teaches how to make sauerkraut and how to do like home style cooking. Almost 300,000 subscribers. She goes, I was terrified to get in front of camera, but Sean just said punch fair in the face. So I did. And I just started. (laughs) So, you know, I think this is a crazy world. And I think you either can do it directly. You could do it to support your real estate business Mm -hmm. or your network marketing business. Mm -hmm. You could do it to just be an extension of your personal brand. Movie stars and athletes are seeing that 
you can't just necessarily always rely on what agents or what others produced for right. you, but you got to go and actually plant your flag. And there's people waiting for you to do it mm -hmm. because they want to be able to have direct access and direct content contact to you. So whether it's you, your business, your partner, your spouse, I mean, someone in your world, I just think you got to get in on YouTube. And Mr. Beast, one of the largest YouTubers said that over the next five to 10 years, YouTube is going to grow unfathomably large because you could feel like, ah, oh, did I miss the boat? You know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's mm -hmm. already, and, and sure there's rising competition, but we don't even understand. Like I wish that I would have hung on to that house back in 2008. Yeah, and yeah. in Seattle, we're trying to buy a house right now so we can get our son up near grandma and grandpa four to five months a, a year. And now I'm looking at people are paying 50, 60, 70 over asking price. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, dang, if you just get in and stay in mm. and you're smart over the years, yeah. YouTube's like a fine wine. It gets better with age. So I encourage people, man, jump into YouTube figure it out, pace yeah. yourself. And, uh, there's a lot of impact you can have, not just in the lives of others, but you can make a great living in the process. Yeah. And that was going to be one of my final two questions was, is there still room on YouTube? Can, can, is it too late to start? And you just, you just hammered it. All right. Last question. And this is more about your personal journey than is, than is YouTube specifically, but this is what we ask every guest. And I'm very uh, curious what you're going to say. If you could go back to any point in your life and tell yourself one thing, doesn't necessarily mean you go back and change anything, but if you just go back and tell yourself one thing, where do you go and what do you tell yourself? <laughs> uh, I just go back two years and say, buy a lot of Bitcoin, dog. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm you, <laughs> you thought I was going to go deep. Yeah, I thought, I thought well, my, my wife was on her deathbed. You know, 2015 was tough. When I had no, that, bleach, hey. that bleach blonde no, hair, I should have, maybe I shouldn't have done it. But I love it. I love, I, it. I love it too, bro. You're right on it too. Right? Yes, sir. But you know what I love about you, Sean? You are full transparency, brother. Yeah, man. Like you, you, there's no holding back. I love the sign behind you, and it speaks ex ex to exactly who you are. Never settle. Yeah, man. And uh, we appreciate your time today. I appreciate you. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, Sean. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Have a good one, brother.